or how many unspeakable tragedies happen on the day, March 11, 2011, when a series of devastating tsunami waves hit Japan. You know the story of the young woman, Miki Endo from Minamai Senriku, Mr. Hirota from Rikuzen Takata, or Mayor Vemira from Fudai, well from our Top Topics channel. In this episode, we bring you another story from those times. It took place in the area of Ishinomaki, where we are currently in the wake of the Japanese tsunami. It's the story of two friends, Yoshio and Akemi, who were forever separated at the time by the devastating wave. They both lived in a small community on the coast called Okawa. It lay in a forgotten corner of Japan, under the hills and among the rice paddies, on the border between modern Japan and the mysterious northern regions. Friends, welcome to the next video on the Top Topics channel. If you are new here, don't forget to give us a like and subscribe and let's go to a new video. Yoshio and Akemi both attended the same school in Okawa, which was located over 200 miles north of the Tokyo Gigapolis on the banks of the great Kitakami River, which, two miles from the school, flows into the Pacific Ocean. The Kitakami is the main river draining the northern region of Japan, known since ancient times as Tohoku, the infamous frontier realm of barbarians, mythical orcs and bitter cold. Even today, it remains a remote, marginal place, a symbol of rural tradition that is but a folk memory to the inhabitants of distant cities. On Friday, classes at the Okawa school were due to finish at 2.30 p.m. Outside, the school bus was already waiting, with several younger students already waiting inside. The older pupils, that means most of the children, including Yoshio and Akemi, were still finishing up their school duties that day in their classrooms. At that moment, an earthquake struck. Yoshio remembers that it wasn't the classic tremors he was used to, where everything rattled and bounced. This time, it was different. The room slowly shifted back and forth a few meters, and an eerie rumbling sound came from within the earth. Yoshio remembers. It seemed gigantic. Teachers were running up and down, shouting, Hold on to your desks! Yoshio was worried about his friend Akami and asked him, Hey, this is big. Are you okay? When it stopped, the teacher said, Follow me outside. So we all put on our helmets and went outside. The school building was evacuated with exemplary speed. Barely five minutes after, the students ducked under their desks. They were on the playground, lined up by grades and wearing hard plastic helmets. Girls from the lower grades were crying. Other students were showing something like earthquake sickness and vomiting. Akemi suddenly asked Yoshio, I wonder if there will be a tsunami. Yoshio looked up. He remembered his great-grandfather telling him a mysterious story from his youth about the rumbling depth of the earth followed by a foaming black ocean that took everything. They both ran to the teacher and told him their fears, but he told them not to interfere with the evacuation, which was going exactly according to the manual, and that therefore they had nothing to worry about and not to panic. At that time, at 3.14 p.m., the meteorological agency issued a warning. The tsunami was expected to come at a height of 10 meters. Like many Japanese institutions, the operation of Okawa Elementary School was governed by a manual, and it said, main evacuation site, school grounds, secondary evacuation site in the event of a tsunami, vacant land 
near the Skrull Ore Park. That is a place just a few meters above the ocean level. It didn't make sense to Yoshio. After all, there are big hills around the school that are so easy to hide in. Plus, there are the school grounds where the students learned how to grow shiitake mushrooms. Everyone knows the area and it's easy to get there by road. So why do they have to stand on the school grounds? These questions kept running through his mind and more and more helplessness began to take hold of him when confronted with the bureaucratic thinking of the school teachers. Yoshio resolutely walked out of the school and shouted loudly, To the hill! Hill! Everybody run for the hill! And immediately said to the teacher standing next to him, If we stay here, the tsunami will engulf us. But the teachers wouldn't hear of it. They argued that in case of further tremors, trees could fall on the children in the forest and that it was safer here. Yoshio and Akemi didn't want to wait any longer and ran towards the hills. Yoshio recalls that one mother tried to convince the teacher that she wanted to go home with her child. She was told, it's dangerous to go home now, so it's better to stay at school. The mom yelled at the teacher. They say there's a 10-meter tsunami coming. The teacher replied, Calm down, ma'am. We know what to do. It was yet another enactment of an ancient narrative whose lines had been written over centuries between the pleading voices of women and the indifferent, imperious refusal of old men. When the earthquake struck and the tsunami warning was subsequently issued, Mr. Yamashita, a man in a grey suit in his fifties, who worked at the local branch of the Ishinomaki municipal government, and five of his other colleagues, got into three cars with roof-mounted loudspeakers and set out to personally deliver the warning to people unaware of the impending disaster. Mr. Yamashita recalls, we were driving about a mile off the coast and something extraordinary was happening at the point where the sea meets the land. The place was Matsubara, a scythe of fields and sand where a strip of pine forest grew along the beach. The trees were centuries old, many of them were around 20 meters tall. I could see the white wave foaming over the tops of the trees, it fell over them like a waterfall. And in the other direction, cars were coming and drivers were shouting at us, A tsunami is coming! Turn around! So we immediately turned around and went back the way we came. At 3.25 pm, they drove past the school and shouted their desperate warning from loudspeakers. The super tsunami has arrived in Matsubara! Evacuate! Evacuate to higher ground! But on the school playground, teachers were preparing to burn wood in barrels to keep the children warm. They didn't pay any attention to us. But the situation was untenable. Suddenly, the deputy headmaster appeared. It looks like a tsunami is coming, he called. Quick, we are going to the traffic island. The traffic island was less than 400 meters away, just outside the village at the point where the road met the great bridge of New Kitakami. As you can see here, this is a spot just a few meters above the surrounding terrain, which then slopes down again. And this is where the teachers would hurt the students, instead of immediately fleeing into the nearby hills. It was a trap. It was a fatal and irreversible decision. As the students and teachers approached the traffic island, the impending disaster was revealed to them. A massive mass of water was already flowing down the Kitakami River. The river was full to the brim, and the first splashes of water had already begun to overflow the protective levee. The teachers in the lead froze in the face of the wave. The others, including Yoshi and Akemi, immediately turned. They immediately ran to the hill behind the school. Yoshio turned around and saw that the water was already massively over the mound and rolling in their direction. 
he had yet to notice that the traffic island, where most of his classmates and teachers were staying, had been covered by the massive blow of another wave and disappeared under the water. They found themselves at the bottom of the hill, in the steepest and most densely wooded part of the slope. At some point, Yoshio realized that Akemi had fallen. He tried to pull his friend up, but failed. Akemi disappeared into the dark water. He scrambled further up the hill. As he did, he looked over his shoulder and saw the dark tsunami rising behind him. It touched his feet. It felt like a huge gravitational force when it hit me, he said. It was like someone was pushing me with great force. I couldn't breathe. I was struggling for breath. Then darkness overcame him. It smelt of brine, mud and seaweed. Suddenly he surfaced and a force threw him up the slope. He grabbed a tree and stumbled with the last of his strength uphill. He was already out of reach of the raging water that had swallowed everything below him. Exhausted, Yoshio fell on his back, blinded by the mud and all he could hear was the splashing, rumbling, crunching and creaking of wood and concrete, metal and tile. He was badly injured, bruised and temporarily blinded, but he survived. His friend wasn't so lucky. From the 78 students who were there that day, 74 did not survive the event. Of the 11 teachers, only one survived. It took many years for the Japanese authorities to admit wrongdoing in the evacuation of the school. For a long time, those responsible defended themselves, but the faulty manuals and the actions of the school staff were so dramatically wrong that the matter couldn't be covered up. And so, five years after the disaster, there was finally, after a long trial, a material compensation for the parents and an admission of guilt by the authorities for the needless death of many children. The school is now a place of pilgrimage, a memorial and a silent reminder that nature and its forces do not care about any manuals and official procedures. Let this be a legacy for future generations, not only in Japan, but everywhere in the world where people are faced with the power of nature. Friends, thank you for watching. In the next episode, we'll explain the mechanics of the actual tsunami hitting the city of Ishinomaki. If you liked the video, please give us a like, subscribe and a bell and we are looking forward to see you at the next video.